A 40-year-long study has led astronomers to conclude that there's something seriously weird about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system doesn't seem to have seasons. The measurements have been taken both by spacecraft and ground-based telescopes. They showed bizarre weather patterns on the gas giant. For example, cold and hot periods throughout the year, which equal 12 Earth years. And at the same time, Jupiter doesn't go through seasonal changes like our planet. On Earth, weather changes between winter, spring, summer, and fall because of the tilt of our planet's axis toward the plane in which it orbits the Sun. This tilt, which is 23 degrees, allows different parts of the globe to receive different amounts of sunlight throughout the year. But Jupiter's axis is tilted toward its orbital plane by a mere 3 degrees. It means that the amount of sunlight that reaches different parts of the planet's surface throughout its long, long year hardly changes. But the new study has found that there are still certain temperature swings that take place all over the gas giant's cloud-covered globe. Astronomers claim they've solved one part of this puzzle. They've found some hints that such unseasonal seasons might have something to do with teleconnection. This phenomenon describes periodic atmospheric changes in seemingly unconnected parts of the globe, which can lie thousands of miles apart. Scientists have observed teleconnection in the atmosphere of our planet, too. One of the most famous examples is known as the Southern Oscillation. That's when changes in the trade winds of the western Pacific Ocean correspond with changes in rainfall across large territories of North America. As for Jupiter, when temperatures rise in specific regions of the planet's northern hemisphere, the same latitudes in the southern hemisphere cool off. Further research also revealed that when temperatures rise in the upper layer of Jupiter's atmosphere, called the stratosphere, it gets colder in the troposphere. This is the lowest atmospheric layer where weather events, such as Jupiter's powerful storms, occur. Researchers hope that by measuring all these temperature changes, they will eventually be able to make a more or less precise weather forecast for Jupiter. Maybe in the future, they will even be able to extend this to other gas giants to see if they have similar patterns. But this isn't the only mystery the gas giant can boast. Let's have a look at some other, no less intriguing puzzles. For example, a 2018 study that found that Jupiter had a delayed growth spurt. You might have heard that the most popular theory about the beginning of the solar system says that, at first, the Sun was orbited by a dust-filled gas cloud. Some time passed, and tiny pieces gathered together into lumps, which later formed planets. But Jupiter was the odd kid. It started off well. The gas giant was gathering around small clumps of matter for a million years or so. But once it grew to be as massive as 20 Earths, its development suddenly stopped. It could have happened after bizarre zones appeared in space. They emitted so much heat and energy that gas molecules struggled to merge with young Jupiter. This period continued for 2 million years. During this time, Jupiter only grew to 50 times the mass of Earth. But once this stage finished, the planet continued to gobble down gas like before. And soon, it swelled to its current mass, about 300 Earths. Jupiter's most famous feature is the Great Red Spot, a giant storm raging in the atmosphere of the planet and capable of engulfing two Earths. But few people know about the Great Cold Spot. It was spotted only recently when astronomers were checking data received by an observatory in Chile. It's believed that Jupiter's auroras spawn this unusual patch, which is around 400 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the surrounding areas. These auroras are ancient. It makes the spot thousands of years old. And unlike the Great Red Spot, it's not stable. It keeps shape-shifting, and sometimes it almost disappears. But it always returns to the upper atmosphere. Usually, it happens after a powerful auroral display. Now, storms are no stranger to Jupiter's atmosphere. But where there are storms, there is lightning, right? Yeah, but the bolts of lightning on Jupiter turned out to be very strange. They release radio waves, which is not strange. But for decades, every spacecraft visiting the gas giant managed to record something bizarre. You see, Jupiter's lightning only signaled in the low-frequency range. 
and no theory could explain why, since lightning on Earth emits radio waves from low to very high frequencies. Finally, in 2018, the Juno space probe solved this mystery. Apparently, the problem was not with the gas giant, but with our technologies. Unlike previous spaceships, Juno had extremely sensitive equipment, and it came very close to Jupiter, so it did record both megahertz and even gigahertz strikes. But even Juno confirmed that lightning on Jupiter was totally different from lightning on Earth. On our planet, lightning avoids the poles. It prefers to zap the equator. Meanwhile, the gas giant's equatorial zone sees no lightning. It lights up the planet's poles and its peak frequency is 4 volts per second. In 2017, when astronomers were searching for the theoretical Planet X, they noticed that some object outside the solar system was tugging at objects within. Thinking it could be what they had been looking for, they turned a powerful telescope in that direction. Coincidentally, that patch of sky contained Jupiter. And even though the researchers didn't find Planet X, they noticed 10 previously unknown moons orbiting the gas giant. This brought the number of the planet's satellite to a total of 79. But the coolest thing was that one of the newly discovered moons was very unusual. The thing is, Jupiter's moons move in packs. So two of the new satellites were spinning with a group that rotated in the same direction as the gas giant. And the rest was in a cluster spinning against the planet's rotation. As for our weird guy, it was inside the second group, but spinning with Jupiter. Unfortunately, it means that the moon will most likely have a short lifespan. An anti-retrograde moon within a retrograde cluster won't be able to avoid a collision. Look at Jupiter's beautiful patterns. Look at these swirls and stripes. For a long time, no one knew the depths of these bands. But in 2018, scientists used a novel way to crack this riddle. This method involved the space probe Juno, which orbited the gas giant every 53 days. Each time it passed by, it measured how strong the pull of the planet's gravity was. It helped astronomers create a 3D image of the stripes. It goes like this. The greater the pull, the greater the mass of the region below. And after examining the gravitational map, researchers concluded that the stripes ran shockingly deep. Most of them plunged to a depth of 1,800 miles. But Jupiter is a gas world, and the winds raging in its atmosphere shift all that mass around, making calculations very difficult. Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field of all the planets in the solar system. It's 20,000 times more powerful than that of Earth. But the gas giant's magnetosphere is a bit wacky. It's unique and doesn't resemble the field of any other planet we know about. Before, experts thought that Jupiter's magnetic field was similar to Earth's. Two poles connected with magnetic lines near the geographical north and south. But Juno showed that things on Jupiter are a bit messed up. The magnetic south pole is pretty well behaved, but the north pole is a different story. Intensely magnetic ribbons and chaotic pieces of field some of them without even positive or negative counterparts. Plus, there seems to be another south pole. It might be that Jupiter's hydrogen ocean generates the magnetic field of the planet. And if scientists manage to solve the mystery of Jupiter's magnetosphere, they might also find out what's happening inside the gas giant. But first, they need to understand the bizarre behavior of the planet's poles. Imagine a still, frozen world. It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa, the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place? It might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. 
Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least, that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, it can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts. This is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride, you know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years too. But Europa isn't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the red planet and it happened 600 times faster than researchers' models accounted for. The question, what or who generated the gas, and where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that may be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There, they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true and they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Which means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the surface temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, the surface of the planet is deeply frozen, and still, 
there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Now let's move to Venus. In 2020, scientists announced that in the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there was something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, scientists didn't have any evidence since there was no chance to collect any microbe specimens or snap any pictures of extraterrestrial life. But they claimed that they had discovered a chemical called phosphine there, and it was a big deal. If it wasn't some previously unknown chemistry that was producing this gas, then there could be some kind of microbial life involved in the process. Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus. This gas is toxic to any terrestrial life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen, for example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there, it can also be produced industrially. Come to think of it, phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere altogether. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. It wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter or famous gas giants. But on Venus, totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be naturally produced on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere, but not as much as astronomers thought they had observed. And it had to make scientists suspicious, but they were too happy about their discovery. They probably thought it meant there could be life on Venus. But even if this gas was created by some mysterious organisms, it would be a big question how they survived on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in environments with an acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid, containing more than 90% of sulfuric acid. The Venusian atmosphere is also 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. And indeed, in 2022, thanks to better and more high-resolution telescopes, it was concluded that there was no phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Or even if there was, it was a very small amount. So far, we need to look for signs of life further away from Earth. Imagine leaving your house one morning and seeing not one, but two stars shining in the sky. The first one is our good old sun, and the other is Jupiter. But how has a planet turned into a star? And what will now happen to Earth and its inhabitants? Before we find the answer to these urgent questions, we need to revise some things we know about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system is a gas giant, which means it's made up mostly of gases. Due to the pressure and temperature differences, these gases separate into layers. This creates those red and white bands that can be clearly seen from Earth. The temperatures at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere are insane. They can reach a whopping 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet also has an immense gravitational pull. In 1995, the Galileo probe reached the atmosphere of Jupiter and sliced it at a speed of 106,000 miles per hour. It survived the scorching temperatures and started its descent. It kept moving even when the temperatures suddenly dropped and the pressure, as well as the speed of the wind, increased. But 58 minutes and 97 miles into its exploration, things went downhill. The pressure of 23 atmospheres and still high temperatures finished the probe off. It was melted and then vaporized by the extreme heat. Now, if Jupiter suddenly decided to keep growing, it would eventually become a star, and its composition would allow this planet to do it. Once, a long, long time ago, Jupiter took most of the mass that was left after the formation of our Sun. That's how it ended up with more than twice the combined material of all other bodies in the solar system. And the planet's ingredients are the same as those of a star, mostly hydrogen and helium. Jupiter is just not massive enough to ignite. But what if it was? Then it would turn into another kind of celestial body, most likely a brown dwarf. In this case, 
it would have a minor effect on the orbits of the planets of our solar system because brown dwarfs are more massive than planets, but not as massive as stars. A brown dwarf is usually 13 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter. It can only become a star if the pressure in its core gets high enough to start nuclear fusion. So let's imagine that it's happened and Jupiter has become a real star. For example, a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars with masses around 7.5% to 50% of the mass of our sun. Red dwarfs are also hotter than brown dwarfs. Their temperature can reach 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit. Our sun, by comparison, has a temperature of almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it means that the newly formed red dwarf will be far dimmer than the sun. And still, red dwarf Jupiter could prevent the inner planets from following their orbits because they wouldn't be able to find a balance between the gravitational forces of the two stars. The planets would move either closer to the sun or closer to the newly formed red dwarf. If Earth chose the first option, our main star's insane temperatures would probably wipe all living beings off the face of the Earth in no time. If it was the second scenario, we'd probably freeze since Jupiter, as a dim red dwarf, wouldn't be able to warm us up well enough. But there could be one more option. The inner planets could get thrown out of the solar system altogether. If Jupiter was a star, it would also greatly increase the amount of radiation the surface of Earth would receive. Our atmosphere would have to protect us both from the radiation coming from the Sun and from Jupiter's radiation. Red dwarfs are notoriously active, that's why Jupiter, just like the Sun, would most likely have frequent coronal mass ejections. This is a fancy expression for describing large clouds of electrically charged particles a star releases with a huge burst of speed. Even now, Jupiter has a significant impact on our planet. The gas giant is roughly 318 times as massive as Earth. And this also means it has an outsized pull on our planet. Its gravity can cause shifts in the orbit of our planet and climate swings every 400,000 years or so. When Jupiter's influence is the strongest, Earth usually has colder winters, hotter summers, and more intense periods of wetness and droughts. Also, if Jupiter turned into a red dwarf, its most prominent feature might probably disappear for good. I'm talking about the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts tower more than five miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is almost twice as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. They were higher than the temperature of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear altogether. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. And now, I have another what-if situation for you. 
What if Jupiter collided with the smallest star we know about? Today, these two space bodies are on a collision course. A spoiler, Earth might not survive such an encounter. Okay, meet this tiny red dwarf. It's the size of Saturn, and its gravity is around 300 times the gravity of our planet. It normally floats 600 light years away from Earth in a double star system. But today, for some inexplicable reason, it's broken all the laws of the universe and is rushing toward the biggest gas giant in our solar system. And even though this space guest is smaller than Jupiter, its mass is way greater, and its gravitational force soon starts to pull on the gas giant. The heat from the red dwarf, plus its powerful gravity, makes Jupiter grow in size. The planet's atmosphere starts to puff up because the gases that make up the planet begin to heat up and expand. Jupiter's atmosphere starts to leak into space toward the stellar visitor. Sometime later, the runaway gases form a bright hot ring around the red dwarf. This is a terrifying view, as if a black hole, a very bright one, has appeared inside the solar system. The star keeps tearing Jupiter apart, eating chunks of the gas giant. And soon, the red dwarf engulfs it completely. Sadly, Jupiter never stood a chance. Instead of the gas giant, we now have a red dwarf surrounded by a ring of hot gases. And we already know how badly it may end. The best thing about it is that this scenario is totally imaginary. Phew, thank goodness. <laughs>